in a minute because we're going live to the Atlas Mountains tonight. <laughs> Not that we can see the mountains because it's after dark. Yes. <laughs> so welcome, Alice. Brilliant to have you here. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you. Yeah. So um, welcome, everybody. Make yourself comfortable. I hope you've got a nice drink to hand. And uh, welcome to Barbara from Portugal. Rebecca's in Manchester this evening. Peter in a very wet bowed. And yeah, it's a grim day today, isn't it? Hello, Judy in Charlotte in the USA. Sarah's in a wet and windy Preston. Sarah in a wet Kent. Yeah, a bit of a theme going on here. <laughs> to Jeremy Woking, welcome. To Anna, hello in uh, Brazil. Thank you for joining us. To Jenny in a very damp Manchester. Catherine's in Scotland which, of course, is where Alice is uh, from when she's not in uh, Morocco. Hello to Laura in Arlington, Virginia. So we've got a very international crew in tonight. In fact, and Vanessa from Malta. So Alice, very uh, international crowd in tonight joining us. Hello to Hazel in Dorset. So, yes, as you join, do feel free to uh, chat in the chat box and also, of course, to ask any questions of Alice because we will be doing a Q&A after her talk. Uh, hello to Laura and to uh, Mike McHugo, Mike and Chris, now in France. <laughs> <laughs> now, Alice, of course, I know them as well because uh, they're from the Casbah de Tubcal in Morocco, which is fantastic. Yeah. Hello to Tor from Lake Superior. Hello, David in Portsmouth. Does say really international tonight. We're just waiting for a few more people to get in and then I'll introduce Alice. And uh, yeah, Alice, so um, as you'll see with the all the people who are in the UK tonight, it's talking about how wet and windy it is. So um, what's the weather like in the Atlas Mountains? Well, I wish you'd send us over some of your rain because it's, <laughs> it's very, very cold here. Um, I was just saying, actually, that when I go to bed, I have to wear like a full snood over my head. And then I actually have a special blanket for my head. It's so cold. Um, but we are desperate for rain. There's been no rain and no snow for a couple of months now. And of course, this is the season when what we really must have snow down to where I live in Hill, which is 1,750 metres, because the Atlas Mountains are like kind of the snow and the, are the water storage system for a huge part of the country and the snow melt is what irrigates the farms in spring and, and gives us crops so really it's it's at very dangerous levels at the moment so we're all praying for you know a heavy rainfall heavy snowfall in the coming couple of months so keep your fingers crossed for us yeah well that's so ironic and of course yeah because you uh you live very close to that tube cow and we always picture that with snow on it as well I know. Well, at the moment, the guides are all telling me that it's an absolute murder to climb at the moment because the snow that came earlier about six weeks ago has hardened into thick ice. And you've got lots of it's quite rocky Mount Tubcal. So, you know, walking on, on old ice and rocks in crampons is is very uncomfortable and a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> um, and you don't pretty white snow that we long for. So, yeah. yes snow is needed oh let's hope you get some soon and uh, i see karen from Su southern california says it's rainy and windy there too <laughs> so yes we need to blow it to morocco hello denise in mallorca <laughs> what's it like there? <laughs> oh, it sounds like it's wet everywhere at the moment except for uh in the atlas mountains okay well, we so <laughs> So welcome, Alice. It's such a joy to have you on uh, this evening from this, of course, postponed event um, because uh, we did have to postpone the previous day, uh, state because of, uh, sadly, Her Majesty when she passed away. But uh, yeah, lovely to have you this evening. So I'm sure you don't need much introduction, but um, I hope everybody does know that uh, Alice, um, you actually are based very much in Morocco. Um, Alice has been called Indiana Jones for girls. She says she rather likes that description and uh, I can see why. It's very fitting. So Alice left her life as a CEO more than 10 years ago to race across Africa on a bike. And after that, she really caught the adventure bug and decided to take on the world's toughest foot race, the Marathon de Saab running six marathons in the Sahara Desert. 
Um, she went to Morocco to train for that event and ended up falling in love with the country and decided to make it her home. And since then, she's completed a number of other challenges, including walking 2,000 miles across the Sahara, filming BBC Two's Morocco to Timbuktu. And she was also the first woman to walk the 500 kilometres of the entire Dra River. And after that, she just decided to carry on walking and do yet more expeditions. So um, her latest book is out, Walking with Nomads, and it covers three of her inspirational journeys. And Alice, congratulations, because, of course, your book's been shortlisted for the 2023 Travel Book of the Year in the Edward Stanford Awards. I know. Awards. I know that. I'm so excited. I'm so <laughs> excited. Look, I'm literally going to bed at night and going, dear God, please let me win this prize. <laughs> Well, we'll all be keeping our fingers crossed for you. So, um, you. yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I think without further ado, because uh, I think everybody will want to be hearing from you now. So, um, over to Alice. Hello, everyone. Now, I have to work out exactly how to do this. I hope you're seeing a beautiful picture taken by me at sunset and completely unfiltered in the dunes in the Western Sahara, just south of a city called Leyun, and that camel is Alistair. It's rather lovely. Today I'm going to be talking to you about my big adventure. I was walking from Nador on the Mediterranean Sea in the north of Morocco, all the way down through the whole of Morocco, and then down through the Sahara and to the border with Gergerat. It was really an epic adventure which which started off and then seemed to continue and roll on. You'll hear a bit about camels, who I came to know and love, especially my favourite, Hamish. So this is me and Hamish. Now, the thing about Hamish is that it was unrequited love, the only kind that lasts. I adored him, and he spent seven and a half months trying to bite me. Um, but the thing about these camels was that they, they were our lifeline. They carried our food, most importantly, our water especially in the Sahara when there was none, and our equipment, and we walked beside them. So you get to know them very well. And for a lot of those months, just because expedition season tends to be in the autumn, winter, uh, spring, because of um, climate, uh, they were in heat because it's male camels that go on heat in the in the natural world. And when they're on heat, they have several very unpleasant to humans characteristics. And one of them is that when they smell a female camel, they blow out this huge Thing that looks like a big bubblegum balloon and it's about the size of a small balloon out of their mouths it's a, a sack it's their kind of sex sack to make them look very attractive and it's full of saliva so when if you imagine that I'm standing I'm leading Hamish I've got him on a leading rein and I'm walking in front of him I spent quite a lot of my time showered in camel spit which is gross so one of the other big important things of my trip, apart from my lovely camels, of whom we had six, was my guides. Uh, these are two of my guides, Amazir guides, and these men were with me for the whole journey. They were Brahima Halfi on the left in that grey and white shesh headscarf, and Brahim, uh, sorry, and Adi Ben Yusuf on the right in his beautiful purple. And Brahim and Adi, when I first knew I was going on this expedition, the one thing I really was genuinely concerned about was being lonely and, and being so different from the people I was with because I knew I was walking with men, Amazir men. I speak Arabic, but I was only just learning Tashlahit. Adi only speaks Tashlahit. Um, very devout Muslims. Brahim on the left there is a half of Al-Quran, which means he's, he's learned the whole Quran off by heart. And in fact, every afternoon when I was writing up my notes for my book, he was relearning sections of the Quran. And what I was worried about is that I was doing something that no woman in Muslim Arabic culture would do, which is to set off with three men who they didn't know and who, you know, they would be obviously sleeping at night. We had separate tents, I hasten to add. But I was going to be spending my life with these men who were not members of my family. I'm not married. It, it, it's completely against the culture. And I was worried, really, that the men would disapprove of me at some fundamental level. And treat me as a client, um, as someone that they had to work with and not as a friend. Those fears were completely destroyed very early on in the expedition. So this is the route we took. Now, as you can see, there are three different lines there. And, and because of the seasons we started in, and actually because when I started the draw, 
which is this blue section, which was my first section from Wazazat to um, Wechibika, just south of Chantan. I had assumed that that would be my expedition. I only intended to walk the length of the draft. But when I got to the end of it, I had had such a fantastic I mean, really mind-blowing experience. I was like, oh, let me carry on. And Jean-Pierre Dachary, my or ex expedition organizer from Desert et Montagne, Morocco, if you ever need to walk across the desert, he said, oh, look, why don't you add on the Sahara, add on the north, and then you'll have done the whole bit. You'll have done the whole of Morocco. So that's exactly what I did. Um, the second expedition started from the same thing. We were very, very extremely careful about starting at the same places. We started at the same bivouac that we finished at, and we walked all the way down through the Sahara, down to Gagarat on the Mauritanian border. Now, this area is a disputed political area. It's uh, declared by the United Nations to be a disputed territory. It's the scene of one of the oldest still running conflicts in the world. And it's disputed between Polisario, who are um, based in Algeria now, and the Moroccan government. The Moroccan government uh, controls, govern, governs this area completely, but it's under dispute and peace talks are ongoing. And in fact, just about a few months after we finished um, the expedition in total, there was a big explosion of fighting on the borders. So it's very much a live issue. It's a very political issue. Uh, Moroccans consider it completely their own territory and do not recognize it as a separate one, but they are willing to hold a referendum. See if the Sahrawis, which people wish to um, leave or not. Uh, I was not there for a political reason. I was there to explore the country and meet the people. And in my book, I just reflect very honestly the views of the people I met along the route. And it's not black, it's not white, it's all shades of gray in between, as you can imagine. The third part of my journey was this green part. And actually this was the bit I was really, really excited about because it was through the Atlas Mountains. I live in the Atlas Mountains, so I feel very, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, kind of like, they're, they're part of my bloodstream now. I, I love them and I was really looking forward to it. Also, the, Adi and Brahim are both from mountainous areas and they were very excited to show me their people, their tribes. Um, and they were like, oh, you know, the food's going to be great. There'll be bread all the way. We'll get water. Water, of course, is plentiful. You'll get water everywhere. So we were very excited to start this. But little did we know in between the Sahara and the, and the expedition, the Corona struck. And we, <laughs> we actually undertook the Atlas expedition in a tiny window between two enormous lockdowns in Morocco, and we were very, very lucky to do it. And it, it, it influenced very much that journey for me for reasons which I will explain when I come to it. So off we set, there we are. You can see us walking in this formation. All the camels are in one line, but very often we, work, we walked, um, me and Brahim with three camels, Adzi and whoever our third guide, because our third guide tended to swap in and out, was with another three camels. And what happened to me on this expedition happened really, I think the tone was set on about day two because we set off for the dry expedition. We had cameras with us. It was, it was, there was quite a big brouhaha. There were lots of people around, you know, it's really exciting. It was like first time I put my tent up, well, helped to put my tent up, you know, waking up in the morning on, on the shores of the Vansasura and the Habib dam. It was freezing cold in the morning. It, it was all terribly exciting and new and different. And I was just getting used to it. And then, of course, everybody left and it was just me and the men and the camels. And I, I just have this memory, very, very strong bone marrow memory. I was walking at the very back behind all the camels. Now, you have to walk fast when you walk with camels. You have to walk at their pace. And I'm walking, I'm stomping along at the back, a bit breathless, a bit kind of I don't know, discombobulated, really. And I'm walking along and feeling quite sorry for myself because I'm like, I'm all on my own the men are at the front and they're all chatting and they, you know, it's, they all know each other and here I am and I've got months of this and what's going to happen? That kind of beginning of any expedition feeling of, of doubt and, and worry. And then Brahim yelled to the back and Brahim had already given me my Arabic name, which is Zahra, which means flower. And he yelled to the back, Zahra! And I was like, yes, Brahim, yes. And he said, Zahra, come here to the front one hand can't clap and that really 
was my acceptance into the team and the start of what has become a very deep friendship. In fact, just before I came on here, I got a message from Brahim saying, how are you? What's going on? I'm about to start another walk with some guests. You know, how are your mother and your father? So those, what I found on this journey, and I talk a lot about this in the book as to how it happened, because it happens over time, is that when you are on a shared endeavor with a group of people, genuinely, you are going to find things in common with this. Our humanity transcends gender, age, race, religion. It completely transcends it. And if you have an open heart and an open mind, which all of us did, including these very religious men, you can create a beautiful friendship. And that was what sustained me through some very hard times on this journey. So here's an example of how I got treated. Hold on, we're going back. Let me try. Anil, can you play the video? We have Anil in the background. Adi just, Adi gave, just me gave me this. Hello. 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 And he says, and he says, says she can eat it. it. I asked, I asked him, him yeah. Yeah. if he's got a foreign yeah. 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 and, 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 and Brahim said he's, he's just, like, just a like a camel. Yeah. Yeah. So the thorns won't hurt his mouth. Sahara. Sahara. Yeah. So there you go. Adi was definitely the prankster of the trip. The Dry River expedition was for me very much one of exploration. We found so much just walking. We uncovered skulls and bones in a, in a cemetery on what had once been arable land, but was now a complete desert. We found Stone Age tools. We found fossilized ostrich eggs all over the place. So really every day brought a new discovery. It, it, was, it was exciting. But the most exciting day of that whole expedition was this one. We had parked up in this little tiny oasis. And this oasis had actually been created because there's only a few palms, probably by seeds from dates or, you know, the date stone that had been pooed out by camels on a previous caravan because this was on a on a route. Um, there was a tiny bit of water, so I managed to do all my washing. And then the time had come. I wanted to phone my mum. I hadn't been able to speak to her. There'd be no signal. And up on top of both of these um, hills, you can see we're parked in a little kind of valley, or a wadi, a valley, and there's two hills. I thought, right, I'll go up and there'll be signal on top, which there was. So I climbed this hill at dusk. And I was literally sitting there, WhatsApping my mum. When I looked up, and here's my face of puzzlement. You can see I'm just sitting on the rocks. I looked up and what I saw in front of me was a very distinct building. Now, all through this route, you pass shepherd's enclosures. They're called azib and they're stone built enclosures um, with, with a small hut, usually for the shepherd to sleep in and for the sheep and the goats to go in if it's cold or raining. And then an encampment, a kind of a, a wall around the outside area where you can, you can put the flock, 200 sheep, 200 goats. Um, but this was very different. This was more like what I, really a bit like a, an old fashioned crofter's house in Scotland. It was a very distinct building. And I thought, I don't it looks like a house. So I wandered over to investigate. Bear in mind, I took this the next day that at the time dusk was approaching. And I could see there was another one there to the left. You can see another building further down to the left, further in the forefront to the left. You can see distinct buildings. And I got very excited. I was like, this is definitely some kind of settlement. And I walked just around the corner. And again, there were more of these he's building. Um, so I rushed down the hill and the next morning Jean-Pierre was coming in to take us to the amazing rock carvings which are just down the road um, and accessible if you, you can go in and then walk to them. So we're about three kilometres I think away from where we're camped roughly. So I said to Jean-Pierre, I was like Jean-Pierre, I, you know, this, let, can we go up and, and have a look at this settlement I found? I think it's really interesting. I'd like to know more about it. What do you know about it? Because he and the men have been working in this region for 40 years, literally. And Jean-Pierre was like, well, there's, there's nothing up there. There's no town. And I went, well, no, there were, really, there are buildings. I, I've seen them with my own eyes. You know, I, w I went up last night and Jean-Pierre is French. He was like, no, there is nothing. You're wrong. I was like, no, I am right. So I forced him to come up the hill with me, which he did not want to do in the morning. And when we got to the top, it was very gratifying for me because, of course, in daylight, I could see that there was a very clear settlement spread over the hill straight in front of us, this one, to the left and to the right, to that hill you can see in the distance, we could see absolute 
habitations, squares, some, some kind of planning. There were what looked like streets, marketplace. And Jean-Pierre gave me back. He went, magnifique. And he was so excited. And then, of course, we decided that we had found, because it's not marked on anything, we definitely found a lost city. We'll claim it. Just down the road, and I think this is what, what obviously this must be tied to the settlement. These are about 4,000 years old. These are the rock carving, carvings um, of Fumsgid. And it's unbelievable. The exciting thing about Morocco is you go there, you can explore. There are no blue plaques. There are no tickets. You just go. You find these incredible sites and you can walk all over them. Try not to damage them, of course. Take photographs and, and really do your own investigation. And there were thousands of carvings there, a lot of the military. Obviously, wars were ongoing, tribal territory, food, water, food resources at that time. The Dry River was quite close, so water wouldn't be a problem. But here, this was my favorite because this is a family of ostriches. And as I said, we found fossilized ostrich eggs all across our route. And as you can see, not only have you got mummy and daddy and all the babies, you've also got an egg. So that was the draw, but moving on to the Sahara. Now, when I finished the draw, as I said, I'd had such an incredible experience that I, I wanted to continue. I wanted to continue with the men. I, you know, we'd formed this, close bond. I wanted to continue with the camels. I love Hamish. And I wanted to keep walking. It was so fascinating. And I don't know, it just expanded everything in my spirit. So off we go and we set off for the Sahara. And then it was like a horrible reality shock because the Sahara was extremely difficult. And at one point, Brahim turned to me and said, Zahara, this is a real adventure. And the reason he said that was that we were we had a lot of things to contend with. And one of them was emptiness. Now, I don't know, you know, if you're seeing all the places people live, whenever you go for a walk, you're going to see a lot of things. You're going to see different types of terrain. You're going to see different plants. You might even be lucky enough to see different animals. You're going to see perhaps trees. This is what I saw for weeks and weeks. This is a this is actually the Paris Dakar route. So this is a very old track. They don't they no longer go on that route because of terrorist attacks. But um, we saw nothing. I got to the stage where I was actually counting ants because that was the only living thing I saw for a few days. But your eyes and your soul adjusts. And one of the weird things is it, when you're walking in that nothingness, it's totally flat. The horizon is 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 curving in front of you, literally curving. You, you go into a kind of a, a fugue state because you almost get dizzy because there is nothing for your eyes to hold on to. An interesting experience. So the only thing is, of course, one thing there was every single day was a wind in my left ear, a very strong Saharan wind. I now understand why polar explorers always talk about the wind because it, it, it really is enough to drive you crazy. Um, just the constant noise and the, the discomfort of it. However, water, water scarcity, as I discussed a little bit while you were all joining, is a real issue in Morocco. We've had a drought since 2014, and it's a real issue in the Sahara and the Sahel, which are drying out. The Sahara has always been able to host life. And actually, there is still life there. And that was one of the exciting things was, was learning to read the tracks of the tiny animals and insects and birds that live there. But water is becoming scarcer and scarcer. And it is due to climate change. It's due to, to warming, to, to the sun getting hotter, the, the rainfall getting less. And one of the things that seems very, very unfair is that if you look into the research, um, places of extreme temperature suffer disproportionately. So as the water dries up, the whole way of life in this region is changing, it's dying. Camel nomads are still there, they're still living, they're still working, and I've talked about some of the ways they adapt in my book. Um, it's fascinating, but the water is drying up. And, and that did cast a pressure and a shadow over us on this journey. Here we're actually at a camel trough in a place called Saki Al Hamra, the Red River. And this water was too salty really for humans to drink, but it was okay for camels. And we've met here with some local nomads. The way we survived through this whole journey was walking from nomad. We would look far into the distance and we knew that nomads were in the area. We would follow to their tent and they would give us water, which they store now in enormous, I mean, the size of my sitting room plastic bags. 
which they refuel with um, water in truck uh, water from trucks, and that's how they can now live. So here am I in Hamish again. Food was also an issue, and and for those of you who are interested in the kind of logistics of expeditions, we had arranged so that every two weeks or so we would either have a food drop or we would be near a centre population where we could go and buy food, like Leon, for example. Um, for the camels, they, they, we walked every, every day in the morning. So we'd walk from early in the morning until round about half past one, two o'clock. We'd bivouac and we'd unload immediately because the camels have to be unloaded very quickly you know, to, to save their energy and save their backs. Um, they would roll around in the sand having a scratch. We'd put the tents up, make lunch, and then they would graze in the afternoon. So we'd hobble them, the front legs, and off they'd go and graze. And whenever we could, we would supplement that diet with oats bought from when we had our food drops or when we were in the town. But they grazed on these tiny shrubs that you can see all around you. And this has always been enough to sustain life. But as I say, now they're drying up. So whenever we had leftover food, I would give Hamish a little treat. And this is pasta, which he was actually quite partial to. So in the Sahara, I've already touched a little bit on the generosity of the nomads. Whenever we, this lady is called Alia, and she had a beautiful white cat on her right-hand side, which isn't in the picture there. But whenever we approached a nomadic tent, um, I always had to go first as a woman so that because it would usually be women inside and the men would be off with the camels and no man could approach um, a woman's tent. They would be frightened, genuinely, and their husbands would be furious. So it was always me approaching. But whenever we, we approached, without exception, we were given hospitality. We were always, always offered tea, sour camel's milk mixed with um, grain, with gufia, which is absolutely delicious. Nothing brings your temperature down like soured camel's milk or soured goat's milk. Um, in one, one camp we went to, the lady was, we, we couldn't stay, always stay for tea because it takes about 45 minutes to make and there's a long ceremony around it. And sometimes we were in a rush. We just wanted to ask them for a little bit of water and to move on. And I remember one lady rushing out afterwards with a plastic bag and saying, take this, take this. And it was some camel meat because she hadn't been able to persuade us into hospitality. So the generosity of these wonderful people, as you can see, Alia here dressed in her traditional Sahrawi robe, um, was very humbling and enjoyable. You know, we had a good time and they were happy to see us, fascinated by me. They were like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Are you married? Which of these men are you married to? And then the woman always ask, where do you sleep? And where do they sleep? So sex is obviously on everyone's mind. So that was one of the, the absolute joys. And the reason I talk, one of the reasons for my book being called Walking with Nomads is because we did. We literally walked with nomads to nomads. And also Addi is a nomad. He's the son of a nomad. But the Sahara also had its fair share of dangers. Snakes, scorpions, um, ticks, which really was quite a big danger because they carry such awful diseases and they've got a very good sense of smell and they like camels. So whenever we bivouacked, you could sometimes see like a, a carpet of moving gray, which was ticks. But it also had its very magical moments. And this is one of them. You can't really see from this, but this is in the middle of a sandstorm. And we'd seen this Land Rover kind of through the haze, heard it, and we knew that he would have a a water storage and in fact his name was Mohammed and he said when you go back to the to your own country tell them my name is Mohammed from the Sahara so this is Mohammed from the Sahara and he very generously not only filled our water carriers for us but also allowed our camels to to water at his trough he opened up his huge plastic sack of water and when he opened up his sack we heard the sudden sound because this was completely empty imagine this completely empty we heard the sudden sound of galloping and camels emerged from this kind of horrific sand dust mist that we were you know, engulfed by with the whistling wind. And they just emerged out of this, like, like some kind of dream, some kind of fairy tale. And in the end, there were about 200 camels. And what had happened was they also had heard the Land Rover and Mohammed came every three to five days to water them. So they all galloped out from their grazing to come and get their water. And again, you know, that one of those memories you're standing there, I just thought, 
how lucky am I to see this? Who in the world gets to be a part of this and to see this extraordinary thing of these camels rushing to get their water in the middle of a sandstorm? So I think those are the joys of adventuring. But there are also dangers. Here we are, this is um, Lahu at the front. Lahu and Adi are at the front with their three camels and me and Brahim are just behind them. Um, Adi's favorite camel was called Callum. By the way, I did give them all their names and I did give them Scottish names. Um, so he's walking ahead with Callum and this is a, what we call a sabcha. And a sabcha is a large flat area of land not far from the sea encircled by dunes. Um, and normally we'd walk around a sabcha, but we decided to cross the sabcha, it looked pretty firm. And we're walking along and you can see it's nice and crisp. And literally we're walking along and I'm talking to Brahim about football. Well, I'm not talking, I'm listening. He was very passionate about the fact that the football coach at that time, not the new one who did so well in the World Cup, was terrible, was paid too much money. So he's bending my ear about that and I'm walking along thinking, oh God, blimey, here we go. And suddenly there was the most almighty scream of panic and sheer terror from Callum, our lead camel. And what had happened was he'd stepped into quicksand and immediately, literally within seconds, a second, he was up to his chest and his legs were complete, his front legs were completely down, engulfed in quicksand. The way we walk is that our camels, they have a, um, a halter around their mouths and each one is loosely tied to the next camel to his halter or to his mouth and because Callum had gone down so far he was dragging Alistair who's the next camel down with him. And it was one of those moments if you've ever been I hope you haven't but if you've ever been in a car crash or if your phone has ever rung at three o'clock in the morning unexpectedly you know that feeling of absolute like your heart stops my heart stopped this was where the experience of the men and their, the bond they have with their animals, which is very strong, really was highlighted because Addi was straight, obviously, at Callum's head, and he's a strong, very, very strong young man. But he, the camel completely trusts him, and he managed to pull his head up and to force his legs to the right out of the quicksand. So if you can imagine this huge, huge animal kind of, erupting out of this dreadful, dangerous, dangerous situation and turning around um, and managing again to take Alistair with them because of the way they're, they're tied. Uh, what we did was we immediately turned around immediately and retraced our footsteps back. But as we were doing that, the second three also fell into quicksand. And again, the only way they came out was because the men are strong and able and dragged them up. My role in all this was the only important thing I did was when the second three went down and all the men went to help, I was left in charge of trying to hold in one place very calmly three extremely agitated, frightened and shocked and moving male cavils. And if you can hear any meowing, it's my cats behind me who are currently fighting. So that was that was the situation that that's quicksand. You couldn't have predicted it. It happened. We were very, very lucky. Um, and you, you always have to take, you know, thanks and luck and gratitude into it because it could have turned out very differently. That was horror. And now here is my happy smiling face. And this is with Farquhar, um, Farquhar the Camel. So my brother named him Farquhar because he said that you can go for the whole trip going, oh, you silly Farquhar, very silly. Um, and as you can see, I am so happy. And the reason I am so happy is that this is after the first Corona lockdown. Now in Morocco, lockdown was extremely strict and you weren't allowed to leave your house. No exercising, no dog walking, no doing a quick run in the morning. We were not allowed to leave our houses. And I personally found that very, very difficult to cope with it mentally. It, I, you know, that feeling of being trapped. I am so lucky. I live in a, a compound. So I had company, there were 25 of us, all in all with all the kids and, you know, the aunties and the uncles all trapped here in this compound. And I have a beautiful terrace, which has the most glorious view and a roof. So, you know, it's not like I was in a one bedroom flat with three kids, some people were, but I did find 
find it difficult. So the freedom of getting out definitely informed this whole journey. And this was the Atlas Mountains. But when it started off, okay, I seem to have missed the slide, but let's start off with this one. When it started off, it was very, very hot. But what you can see here is the glory and beauty of the landscape. Look at that sky and imagine what that was like after being in Corona. This is walking down to um, the lake of the bridegroom. And the story is that a bridegroom and a bride were separated because their families didn't approve and they ran away together, but then they couldn't bear to be away from their families. And they cried so many tears that they created both these lakes. And Brahim said to me, when we went to the next lake, he went, this just proves that women do not love as deeply as men because that lake is less deep than the man's one. But as I say, really for me, this whole journey was informed by the joy, the freedom, the freedom, because that's all I can call it, of walking, of being under those vast skies, of being in this kind of landscape, which I personally adore, which is desert with mountains on each side, where everything is clear. And again, I'm going to pause so you can hear the call to prayer. There we go. That informs my days and nights here. This journey also, this part of the expedition was also very interesting because we went through the heartlands of the Medelt, which is where they produce a, a huge amount of, or used to, of Morocco's agriculture in the days before mass agriculture. Now a, a large part of it, the, the tomatoes you'll find in Tesco's, the strawberries you'll find in Morrison's are actually from the south of Magadir. But in olden times, this was kind of the breadbasket of Morocco, the north, because there's water. And it's also where the best apples come from. And here you see a very, very traditional Amazir Berber village made from the clay of mountains. So where I live here in Imlil, everything's red because the clay is red, but here it's all white and grey because the clay is that colour. And you can see how rich, wherever there's a tiny bit of water, how rich everything is. But just to talk a little bit about the nomadic communities here in the mountains. The nomads of the Sahara are actually rather rich. Um, they get a lot of, uh, they do get quite a lot of things um, subsidized by the government. They get their water and a camel, if you have a, a herd of 200 camels, you are a rich person because camels are worth a lot. Now they're really sold for meat rather than transport. But you know, if you're having a big wedding, someone will buy a camel, it, it gets a good price. So camel herders are relatively, and this is all very, very relative. So please bear with me. But usually the person who owns the camels would be considered to be rich. The nomads of the northern mountains and the, and the central mountains of the Atlas, by contrast, live a very, very stark, difficult life. Now, they are, of course, rich in so many things, but in terms of actual physical hardship, life in the mountains, it's very, very cold in the winter, very cold. You don't have access to dentists, to doctors. Um, you know, you're moving. You, often people are semi-nomadic, so they'll have winter pastures and summer pastures, but you'll be living in very, very basic accommodation, a tent or like here in Azib, as I explained before. Um, but it's it, it's a very proud lifestyle with very strong traditions. And of course, when I see it from the outside, I see all the values of families working together, the freedom they have to just roam, the bond they have with nature but there is no getting away from it. It's a very harsh lifestyle. And during Corona, I've just mentioned that I found it very difficult psychologically because I was in my house and I wasn't allowed out. But that is, is so pathetic, really, when I compare it to the hardships that the nomads faced. And you imagine that nomads would not face many hardships because actually they're wandering out in the open. Of course, they were made to stay anywhere. They wander, they have their flocks, etc. They're very self-sufficient. But their basic staple diet is flour for bread, tea, sugar, and then meat occasionally. And of course, vegetables or rice or pasta that they buy from the market. And in order to buy those staples, they have to sell their sheep or goats. Um, and in normal times, you know, a sheep or a goat would say, uh, fetch 500 dirhams, 50 quid, 48, 45 quid. Um, but during Corona, all the restaurants shut, all the hotels shut, the tourist trade, which tourists typically eat quite a lot of meat compared to Moroccans, died. There was nothing. And Moroccans themselves tightened their belts so they weren't buying meat. So the market for sheep and goats plummeted. And 
you could, if you were lucky, you'd get 150 dirhams instead of 500 dirhams for your sheep or your goat. This impacted the nomads terrifically because they relied on their staples. They relied on selling their animals to get their staples. So whereas I was like, oh, you know, it's very difficult for me being locked in the house. These are people who were suffering really true, very difficult hardship. And we heard stories and saw people going to the local shop, the very, very small shop, and asking the shopkeeper just to take an animal in exchange for some tea, some sugar and some flour. The joy of walking. One of the places I loved walking is we, we went to this place called Batbul, and it was it's an old Jewish path, actually. It's a, an ancient place where the Jewish caravans used to come through. And it's in this incredible gorges where I think if you can see from the picture, very striated rock. Um, and always when the sun hit, the sun would hit at certain points and everything glowed golden. But let me bring you to the point of excitement in my life. Now, there may be those amongst you who already know this, but this tiny line of footprints here is actually dinosaur footprints. And one of my big aims on the Atlas expedition had been to find some dinosaur remains because in, the, in these mountains, you know, both in the reef in the north and further south, there are lots of areas where remains have been found. So before I set off, I got in touch with Dr. Susie Maidment from the um, Natural History Museum in London, who's a dinosaur expert and has worked in Morocco. And I was like, you know, I'm doing this. I might call on you to, just to look at things and give me some help. And for 10 weeks of this expedition, as we walked, I searched for blooming dinosaur footprints. And, you know, we, we We'd, all during the day, I'd be looking around me thinking, oh, is, is, is that a dinosaur footprint? Or is that a pub? Um, you know, everything. And the men started to take the piss out of me completely. I remember one day, Andy coming up to the little chicken bone and going, look, Zahra, look, it's a dinosaur toe. It was very irritating. But as we got to the very end of our journey, literally, I think, 10 days before the end, maybe even slightly less. And I was, you know, I was, I was Quite frustrated because I thought, come on, surely all of this trying to find these blooming footprints. Um, Jean Pierre had actually looked online, found a site where there are some recognized dinosaur footprints, and it was driving in. God, it was like a huge drive, 20 hour drive, driving in to meet us to, to you know, to, to find these prints for ourselves, to see these prints for ourselves. And the end result of that was we were walking through a gorge very like the one I've just showed you. And then up to our left, Brain went, look, Zahra, look up. Those are prints, aren't they? And I looked up and there they were. But there was more to come. Jean-Pierre is a man of, of great ambition. And he decided that once we'd found them, we had to look for more. And we saw some here. I don't know if you can see to the right of the tree, these kind of big holes. And this is, again, a set of footprints. And what happened, of course, was... This area was all flat before and had this very thick clay mud. The animals would have walked, animals? The dinosaurs would have walked through them, left the footprints, and then as our continents, Africa and Europe, collide, the Atlas Mountains were squeezed up and the footprints came on the cliffs. So Jean Pierre had decided that we would actually climb up to these footprints. And am I in? I'm not in this picture here. This is one of our guides, um, Ali, and that is, that's Brahim actually. And then there's you shoe down below and we're all roped up and they made me climb up this cliff, which you can't see this, but it was about 50 meter drop below. The cliff was extremely friable. So A, I didn't want to damage anything and B, I was worried about falling to a horrible death. So although it was a terribly exciting day and I heard a lot more about it in the book, it was also a day of complete terror because I thought I might die. I didn't. You shoe in the orange turban there, the orange shesh, actually had me roped in and had me roped in so tightly that, you know, unless, I don't know, a comet suddenly appeared in the sky and shot me down, nothing was going to happen to me. But the brain's a fantastic thing. And here is one dinosaur footprint. Now, this is about... So my head would fit into that top right hand corner. Um, I can't remember. I took measurements. I think it was 116 centimetres by 90 centimetres. And it is the footprint. I, I have liaised on this with Dr. Susie Maidman of a sauropod, a vegetarian dinosaur. And, you know, what was fantastic was after I'd done my climb and fought with death, well, in my own head, um, after I'd done my very brave climb, Though none of my climbing friends would think it was brave. I actually got to put my hand very gently into that dinosaur footprint. And it was one of the 
most exciting moments of my life to just be there to know that these incredible creatures had roamed the earth before me and that I could actually touch history in that way. The joys of exploring. But our journey had to come to an end and this I think was taken on very close to the ending. There's little, is that sausage? I think that's sausage. We're passing by the Casbahs and the valleys and coming into our final stop of Wazazad. And the feelings as you come to the end of an expedition are, are, are very complicated because on the one hand, I've, my, these are my feelings, I can't speak for everybody. You're tired physically, very tired and mentally, and you have to keep your focus right to the last minute because something, you know, bad things can happen on the last day, in the last moment. You have to keep focus. And in fact, we actually had a very difficult incident with a snake, a camel, and a big hole on our second last night. But you're still concentrating, but you're coming to the end. And then you have to start thinking, and especially for me, I was coming to the end of my journey with these men and with these camels. And that was going to be the end of our story. Of course, we still keep in touch and we still see each other. But remember, in Moroccan culture, men and women can't really be friends. You know, you're married and then you're in the social groups of your family. But it's not the common custom in traditional societies here to have male and female friends. So I can't really continue a friendship as I might have, say, with a European guy who I would go and do other walks with or meet up for a drink or go and meet his family. That's not possible. So our story together was coming to some kind of conclusion. Uh, I found that very, very difficult. My emotions finishing were joy at completion, joy at the discoveries I've made, happiness at the times we'd had, but also really quite deep sadness. But that sadness was not really allowed to prosper because on the very last day, we walked into Dardai, which is Jean-Pierre's Riyadh, at the very edges of Wazazat in an oasis. And he had arranged a huge surprise for us. You can still see we've still got Corona on there. He had arranged for a traditional welcome for the caravan. So in the olden days, when the caravan trade was, was plying its way across the whole of North Africa, the whole of the Sahara, down into equatorial Africa, all the way up through into the gates to Europe, when the caravaneers came home, what would happen was the whole village would turn out for them and the musicians would come out in their special robes with their drums and with their tin horns and they would dance and sing and all the women and the children of the communities would join in and welcome the caravaners home. <coughs> Sorry, I feel really emotional. So. That's what Jean-Pierre did for us. He arranged for them, and you can't see it here. Unfortunately, this is a video, but it, it can't play, but I'm sure in the recorded version, you'll be able to see it. The villagers from either side, bear in mind, they've been stuck in with Corona. They saw six camels, they heard the music and everyone in their traditional robes. They saw us walking along and they all came out and they danced and they cheered and they clapped and we drank camel milk and ate sweet dates. And that is how this incredible journey across Morocco and the Sahara ended for me. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you've got some questions. Um, here's a couple of my books and here's all the ways you can keep in touch with me or follow me. Um, and now back over to you, Lynn. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. Oh, really, really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, so much as ever to take in. And, uh, absolutely fantastic now one of the questions we have been asked is is tonight being recorded yes it absolutely is <laughs> so for those of you yes who, who do want to see it again um then absolutely we'll be sending out a link in the next few days and that will also have that final video in, in as well where uh, alice was getting very emotional or not surprised yeah, sorry about that <laughs> so um yes look out for that and uh yes as i say that will come out in the next few days so do send in any questions we've had a few but um yeah we we can um, chat for at least another 10 minutes so do send through any so um let's look at the questions so um alice how many days was your expedition well of course it was that was three different ones in a way wasn't it but well, yeah, what was the time scale? I'm not sure. Yeah, the time really scale it. was seven and a half months. Um, the longest single expedition was Sahara. 
the shortest one was the Atlas. So it was kind of roughly, very roughly, two and a half months, three months, two months. Um, and we covered around, and again, it's approximate because we didn't keep our GPS on all the time because we couldn't carry enough batteries. Um, and we didn't use it to navigate. Brahim navigated in the Sahara by the wind and the sun, which was extraordinary. So we think it was around 4,500 kilometers all in all. Wow. And uh, I mean, did you, <laughs> how did you actually start all this? I mean, did you know anything about camels? Yeah, I mean, that, that's so fascinating. You could talk for hours about Hamish alone. But did you know anything <laughs> at all about camels beforehand? <laughs> I mean, I'd been on a few, but no, I knew absolutely nothing about camels. And to be honest, I'm, wasn't very keen on camels really because I mean, they do they bite they spit they kick um they cover you in spit but really walking with so the way I started it was that I actually my only skill is at finding people who I can do things with who are much better at everything than I am and I found Jean-Pierre Dachary and honestly if you ever come to Morocco and want to do anything in the south of Morocco in the desert he is your man and all his contacts are on my website and together we we decided what we wanted to do and then he organized everything because he he employs Adi and Brahim and one of the good things and he owns the camels and actually I liked both of those things because why because it means that Brahim and Adi are on a proper salary they have they have benefits they have medical care and they have a pension so you know so many guides and Lynn you'll know this so many guides are on day rates and there is no safety for them if something goes wrong whereas Jean-Pierre looks after his men and he also looks after them fiscally and the same with the camels you know the camels are not just are, are, are owned all the time so they're properly vet checked they're properly tagged they're really cared for they're fed and and those things are important to me so basically i found this trip yes i did it and i walked it but jean pierre is is the brains behind it or the, and he did the most fantastic job so my top tip to anyone is find someone who's really good at the bit you want to go to and then hook up with them yeah, oh, absolutely. And, uh, so good to hear that and that you're um, giving credit where it's due. All right, question from Jeremy. Um, interested to know, how do you handle the balance between dehydration and overhydration? Because um, when he visited Morocco, he found it a difficult balance. That's a really good question. Well, I, and actually, sometimes you can drink too much and, and it dilutes all your, your salts and, you know, the minerals in your body. But really, we were suffering really genuinely from water stress on almost the entire journey. So I would say definitely I was on the dehydration side at all times. And one thing that is quite funny is camels walk quite fast and they don't stop. And, you know, we had them loaded. They were never going to stop them. We stopped them once for Cascrute at 11 o'clock, our tea break. Apart from that, you're walking. So I did not want to have to stop and pee because if you have to stop to pee, you have to run to catch up. Yeah, so of course. I'm, Get left yeah. behind. Oh. Yeah, you do. And, and I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit of a laugh, like running to catch up. Of course, I can run to catch up. But then you've still got five hours ahead of you. So you literally buy, and it's something I learned, don't drink too much. Only drink enough so that you can pee at your pee at the tea break and then when you finish. So I actually rationed myself on water um, and, and was thirsty because I didn't want to have to stop to pee. Oh, yeah. No, well, very good point. Very practical on that. In fact, I'm surprised nobody asked you about peeing because um, so often when it's a woman adventurer, one does wonder about it. Um, so do you feel that you changed as a person after this expedition? And if so, how? Ooh, that's a big question. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. I think, I mean, I think like everyone else in life, big experiences in your life do, do change you or, or kind of give you experience. And I think the thing that I learned really i mean i loved this expedition i love this region i love the people here you know i love hamish but it, it was so enriching i just think my level of gratitude was extremely high not always i mean sometimes i was really fed up the wind made me fed up but what i think what i learned was patience 
And that was partly just from the nature of doing this kind of expedition, um, but also from walking a lot with Brahim and talking to him because, you know, he he nicknamed me Tfilfilatarran, which means hot chili pepper, because he felt I was very tempestuous. And I was, my nature is naturally quite impulsive, quite reactive. I'm like, oh, let's do this now. Um, and of course, what this kind of journey teaches you is you have to be patient. And I have seen the genuine benefits of just sitting back, waiting, allowing things to take their course, maybe not allowing yourself to get angry at small things, just waiting to see how things turn out, see if you can gain a deeper understanding and therefore enrich your own soul by that understanding, you know. Those early days walking through the Sahara, I was really quite grumpy. It was, we were walking really fast, much faster than we had before. It was, you know, I was very hot and uncomfortable. There was nothing to look at. Um, at one point we walked, I think for nearly, certainly for a week, maybe even two weeks, quite close to a tarmac road so that we could access water. Um, and I was like, where, where, where? But then, and I, I expressed this to Brahim because I was walking with him going, rrr, rrr. and he said, look, just wait, wait and see. And then, of course, as you wait, you know, you notice the sunset. There's mm. the tiny drop of rain and it's like some kind of manna from heaven. You appreciate every tiny thing. The first glass of hot, sweet tea after five hours in the Saharan boiling wind in your left earlobe. Honestly, it was heaven. So I think I learned I learned appreciation and I learned patience. And I'm trying to keep those things in my mind. Yeah, uh, very good, very good. Right. Pamela asks, are the nomads that you met Berbers? Oh God, that's such a good question. So in, in the center and the north of the country, so for the dry, most of the dry expedition and for the Atlas expedition, yes, they were, they're Amazir, they're Berbers. In the south of the country uh, and in the Sahara, they're Saharawis. But, and I've desperately tried to work out the genealogy of this. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right word, actually. The, the, the racial composition of the people. And it is thought <laughs> that they do, they are a big mixture, but they do have Amazir blood as well. And the Amazir tribes went down to the south and that is those people, but they call themselves Saharawis, Saharan people, and they are very distinct. They have a distinct form of Arabic called Hassaniya, which is different from the three Amazir languages, Kashlahit, Tamazirt, and Tabikfit, um, which are in the center and the north of the country. Okay. Um, so, yeah, how, how much Arabic can you speak? And the color of Arabi mea fin mea, Yanni Mashi Mishkil Fiha, and that's you Fakru and Anamin and Machlev, our Anamin Tunis, our Anamin and Lukdan. I speak good Arabic. Yeah. People think um, so, it is quite interesting. I, I'm always very complimented when some I'm at the vegetable queue in the, in the supermarket or in the market, and someone says, Oh, sorry, I didn't know you were Moroccan in Arabic to me. That's like, oh, but oh so, what a compliment. I know, is it? Oh, but quite often people think I'm Egyptian or Syrian because I speak Arabic, but I have an accent. Yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah, which they've probably got quite put. Uh, right, Hazel asks, what sort of training do you do before an expedition? Oh, Hazel, you have found my Achilles heel. I hate training. And I am, I think we can, anyone who knows me, all my friends will agree, I am really, really bad at it. So I don't do enough is the answer. Um, the one exception, I'd say I trained well for the Marathon des Sables. Um, my training for the Tour d'Afrique when I cycle across Africa consisted of me sitting, it was November, it consisted of me sitting on a, um, like, a, you know, a stationary bike, watching Strictly Come Dancing, pedaling half-heartedly and eating chocolate. So... <laughs> I do not train enough. And actually, I, at the moment, I'm about to start training for, I'm climbing a mountain in three weeks' time, and I, I'm about to start training. So that gives you an idea. I don't train enough. I'm not a good person about it, too, because it's one of the things I'm actually genuinely trying to work on. Um, but I would say that what I should be doing is making sure I'm completely fit, doing flexibility and core work, and just walking a lot in the mountains. That's the best training you can do in this this kind of thing yeah yeah sure uh jeremy asks are trips like this one um also mirrored as trips one can purchase so in other words yeah is is there a way that um somebody yeah. watching they, they're not gonna they don't want to do the whole seven months but is there a way somebody could do yeah. a short camel trek 
there absolutely are. And I mean, actually, Brahim, who I said just texted me before I came on, he's just about to start off for 20 days, which is, I think, pretty doable. Fortnite, very doable. And I, again, you know, I sound like I'm advertising him. I am because I live in Morocco. I've done loads of this stuff now. He is your man. So, Desiree Montagne, Morocco, JP Dacha, D A T C H A, at gmail.com, and he will sort you out something that you want to do. But um, they don't come cheap. They come, Morocco's about, it's the cheapest place you're ever going to get to do this stuff. But, you know, be prepared that you will have to pay costs for it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And um, Tor asks, do you have a special visa or status that allows you to stay in Morocco for such a long period? Yeah, you have a carte de séjour, a residency permit, and you have to renew it. In fact, mine's up for renewal in December. Um, and then the last one, I think, was four, three years, and I should be able to get a 10-year one when I renew, hopefully, inshallah. Right. Um, all right. Fawzia asks, um, you said there's lots of dangers in the desert, like snakes and ticks. What did you do to, to protect yourself? <laughs> Anything? Well, snakes, you just have to really keep your eyes open, truthfully. Um, you know, they're not going to come into camp because they don't want to see humans. So it's more a case of not stepping on them. Uh, and I mean, there were times when you know, at one point I'm walking along and I'm, I'm always walking along, chatting, having a look, taking a photo. And suddenly Raheem like violently shoved me, really pushed me out of the way. And Anzi leapt up into the air screaming. And what it was, it was a snake almost under our feet, which of course was more scared than we were. It, it went off, but they are very dangerous. And I mean, the only time I did something really stupid was there's a special kind of viper here, the horned viper, which is lethal. I, I had um, Sira, I had anti-venom with me, but you know, is it going to work? Or well, you have to get to a hospital quite quickly. And we were miles from anywhere. Anyway, there was um, a dead horn, horned viper in in the wet, in the riverbanks. Oh, look, it's a dead horned viper. I'm going to go and take photos. So I'm standing over this horned viper taking a photo when Ali comes like creeping up to me and says, get off there, Zahra. It's not dead. It's sunbathing. Oh, <laughs> Oh God! Honestly, oh, that could be interesting. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I, I, you're gonna, I, you probably came on here with illusions of this fabulous person, and I'm destroying them with my stupidity. <laughs> no, we can all identify. We can all identify. <laughs> uh, right, Hazel says, "Can we put the contact email for the trip organizer in the chat?" Tell you what, we will do, Hazel. We'll put it in the follow-up email. That would be the easiest. Yeah. Um, we'll do that um, and any other useful info we think. Um, Glenn asks, do you have any more information about the lost village that you found? Because, yeah, that was intriguing. Yeah, it was really exciting. And the answer is no, I have. Well, I mean, the problem is I always get involved in new projects, but I have thought about trying to go back with the team because I think it would be really fun to investigate further. It's, it's definitely on my to-do list because there's something there and we, sh you know, even if it's to explode my own story, I think it would be really good to go back and do some investigation. Yeah, absolutely. Great to find out more. Um, right, Vanessa says, uh, well, it, it, it's a bit of a comment because she says about how life in the compound in Imlil sounds uh, really interesting. Now, she says, how is life there? Now, uh, obviously, I think that would take up another hour, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it, she says it sounds like it could be a story in itself. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'd be quite interested to know what people think, because I'd quite like to write the book of, you know, my, my Berber life, because I yeah. don't think many people are doing what I'm doing. Um, and of course, it's so lovely living in this community. It's, it's really fun. People, they, you know, I'm part of the family now. And I mean, sometimes it drives you crazy. But other times, like this morning, you know, the kids are like knocking on my door, Alice, 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 what have you got for us today? Because they, they treat me like a kind of eccentric aunt. So what they would want is treat. <laughs> um, and, you know, I came out with, I had a half a Terry's chocolate orange left over from Christmas. So I went out with my half an orange and I said, so I'm speaking in Tash Lahit. I'm learning Tash Lahit. And I'm like, so guys, what yeah. do you think this is? And they go, it's an egg. I'm like, no, it's not an egg. Um, what color is it? And they go, it's orange. I'm like, yes, I'm saying it's orange. What fruit is orange? And like the little girl who's five, she's like, 
it's an orange, it's an orange, it's an orange. And then I gave them a segment each and they just loved it. And then they go, can we have one for mom? Please, please, can we have a piece for mom? So my half a chocolate orange is now gone. But there's it, you know, it's fun. It's fun being part of a family, learning every day, learning Tashlahi, learning how people live and seeing every season how people live and being part of the community. I, I feel very lucky. I think it's a great idea for a book oh, um, you. because, you know, people are fascinated how people live in other countries. And, you know, we've seen all these, the, you know, those whole space books of people who'd moved to Spain, moved to France. <laughs> My year of and, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think your life in Imlil will, uh, would be really fascinating. Um, OK, so I think only time for one more question. So, yeah, like one I would have asked you anyway. What adventures are next for you? Well, very fortunately, I have one coming up soon because sometimes people ask me this question. I'm like, oh, I'm working on it, but nothing's happening. Um, in three weeks time, I was brought up in Uganda in the foothills of the Ruanzoris, um, because my parents were teachers. So I went to Uganda when I was six weeks old and I'm returning to Uganda. So this is um, a bit of a heart voyage to climb a volcano, which is called Mount Elgon. Um, and I'm doing it with a charity called Salv, which works with street children in Uganda, trying to, you know, get them to school, get them back to their families and get them away from drugs and prostitution, which you can't argue with that, can you really? So I'm really looking forward to it. So that is what I'm doing. So in three weeks time, and I really have to start training to the lady who asked me about it. It's like <laughs> day after tomorrow, notice it's not tomorrow. Um, yes, I'm climbing this volcano. And I'm also hoping to go up to, it's in a different area from where I used to live. But I'm, I've got, I've booked an extra week of just airtime. I've got nothing planned, but I'm hoping to travel up to where we used to live as a family. Um, I'm slightly, and also to go to a rhino sanctuary, which is in that region, which I think would be really fascinating. Um, slightly concerned to go back to my childhood in that way. We left when I was eight because uh, there's been, an, the Lord's Resistance Army were very active in that area. And I heard that the school that my parents worked out was burned pupils burned alive for students uh, I hope it's not true um, so I don't know I think I'll go back but there is a part of me that's hesitant you know because I have these kind of dual like I'm sure everybody does those early childhood memories I have some I have few but they're very precious and I, I almost don't want to overlay harsh ones with them but you know mm -hmm. Uganda has come Uganda's developed really well it's had prosperity for a long time um, so I'm hoping. The only other thing is, of course, there's also an Ebola outbreak in the north, which I'm going to take consideration of that because it is, you know, the height of stupidity to swan into things that are actually, you know, dangerous. Ebola is very dangerous and very infectious. Mm. So if there is a big outbreak, I will not be going up. But I've got Mount Elgon to climb. So think of me in three weeks' time, striving up to this volcano. We will. We'll be thinking of you uh, training <laughs> in the next few weeks. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, well. At least you've got some amazing, amazing hills and walks on your doorstep. Yes, there in I, have. I haven't really. I'm yeah. not, you know, honestly, this training thing is, is I really have to, it's something I really have to improve on because I have no excuse apart from innate laziness. Well, as I say, I think a lot of us can identify with you because, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's um, we're in awe of you as well, of course. But uh, it just makes it all seem all the more incredible, the journeys that you do. do. So thank you so much, Alice. Thank you, thank you everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, look out for that video, uh, the uh, sorry, follow up email which will include the link to the video of tonight and we'll put in a couple of useful links, details of Alice's website and books and uh, any useful contacts as well in case you're going to go do, do a bit of that yourself. So uh, thank you again, Alice. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Fantastic. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic magazine. Oh.